Hello everyone and welcome to the Sunny in Phoenix podcast, a weekly podcast where we keep you up to date on everything Phoenix Suns basketball. And sadly, this week, Mitch is back in Iowa, David's back in the Wild West, but we're all here together in this Google Hangouts call and we have a great episode planned out for today. So we're going to talk about how the Suns have looked since the All-Star break, our newfound enforcer. The future of our two rookies, two of our rookies, Tyler Eulis and Derek Jones Jr. And then, since it is March, we'll be talking about some March Madness action, as well as what draft prospects we'll be keeping an eye on. I'm Charlie Erling, and I have Mitch Krumpetich and David McGraw with me here today. How are you gentlemen doing? And yes, Mitch, I paused on your last name. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. You, you nailed it, though. Uh, I'm as good as I can be not being in Phoenix this weekend. I am, like, I'm basically in Phoenix right now, but without civilization. So, like... <laughs> the Wild West. I'm Pretty much. The middle of nowhere, literally. <laughs> so, you know, it's hot. It's getting hot, at least. And I'm not looking forward to the next month. Yeah, you know, it, it is warming up. I'm sitting in my upstairs office. It, the The thermostat reads over 80 degrees right now, but I'm just too cheap to turn it on already, so I'm holding out. But hey, Mitch, you have some big news. What's up, man? Well, speaking of warming up, the weather isn't the only thing warming up. The cheese is warming up, too. (laughs) (laughs) You can get a shirt that says that, minus the two part at the end, if you visit tpublic.com slash user slash sunny in phx that's t-e-e public.com slash user slash sunny in phx we love all of the support from those who have bought t-shirts and if you have throw it on your instagram with with that link in there or your facebook or your twitter anyway the real news the exciting news uh, I was a guest on Chris Horwadell's podcast, Deepish Thoughts, and uh, it was really exciting for multiple reasons. One, it's a great podcast, and I was really excited to be a guest. And two, we will be joining that podcast network starting next week. So uh, we'll, we'll have some new things like a new iTunes feed and everything like that. But we will make sure to tweet all of that information so those of you who already subscribe to us on iTunes can find the new link. But it's going to be great for us and for you guys, we believe. Absolutely. And we'll be posting all of this information on our social media, so be sure to check that out between now and then. Our Twitter is at SunnyInPHXPod. Our email is SunnyInPHXPod at gmail.com. And of course, you can always check out the website at sunnyinphxpod.com. Okay, we're recording this episode right before the Mavericks game on Saturday afternoon. So as of right now, the Phoenix Suns are 3-5 and five since the All-Star break. And since then, pretty much every team stat category has been improved. So we saw that short three-game winning streak. But within that winning streak, we definitely saw our Suns turn a new page to the season. And one of the biggest things that has happened since the break, the thing that is most noticeable is we removed Tyson Chandler and Brandon Knight from the rotation. Nothing much has been said about Knight yet, but we did get some clarity about Chandler from an event for Phoenix Suns season ticket holders. Uh, Sarver, Robert Sarver said that Chandler was given the chance to either be traded to a playoff team or waived and then later signed by one after the deadline. But Tyson was given the opportunity for that, but he said, no, I want to stay here in Phoenix. I'm fine sitting on the bench. So that's great news. There's something right happening here. But what do you think this means for Tyson Chandler and the future, his future career here as a son? I think it definitely means that he is devoted to the team. I am a big, almost homer for Tyson ever since the 2012 Olympics. So I have a real big soft spot for him. I don't really care how he plays. I just love the dude. And hearing this makes all of that, like, feel even even more so. Like, kind of doubled almost. It, It makes me feel like he's really 
invested in this team and wants these young guys to do well and if that means that he's sitting on the bench and only practicing then he's okay with that and that makes me feel really good makes me feel like we're doing something right i mean he's still getting paid too so i'm sure he's fine with it oh yeah but a a point running off of he's still getting paid he's practicing but he's he's uh missing out on logging a ton of minutes and I I was actually thinking about this last night since he's going to miss the next I'm not even sure exactly how many games are left on the schedule but he'll be missing those games he won't be playing those minutes maybe that extends the career of Tyson Chandler another year or maybe not even extend it but gets him extra fresh for the start of next year maybe this is uh, some nice time off for Tyson and maybe we'll reap the benefits of this next year. Yeah, that's true. Um, he also, I mean, of course, this also gives us a ton of time to give uh, Alex Len and Big Saw some run time. So it could also be um, I, I, just time for him to kind of know who's going to be his running mate next year. Right. And then, so a big reason why we've been able to sit Tyson with success is definitely the emergence of big sauce, Alan Williams. So we've been hyping this guy up all year. We've known, but now now everybody in the NBA is getting put on notice. So big sauce played in 23 games before the All-Star break, just averaging over seven minutes per game. Since the All-Star break, he's played in each game and gets 25.3 minutes per so those stats that go along with the big minutes boost are great too. So in those 25 minutes, 14.5 points per game and 10.3 boards per game. So he's, he's averaging a double-double since the break. So here's the question. What do you guys think? The big sauce has been overflowing our passion buckets for the last couple of weeks. Has he <laughs> proved himself as an NBA player? Well, so with that being so eloquently put, I'm gonna say yes. Um, I I I feel like we've been on the the bandwagon since the end of last year when he had that big game against the Kings to finish off the season. Um, oh, with all those per 36 numbers, but now he's getting those minutes, and his numbers are still up there. He's get he's got five straight double doubles as of the recording of this episode which is a son's record off the bench. Uh, he's putting in work. He's putting in work against real NBA players and not slowing down. So I, I think that he definitely has a spot in the NBA. I'd say give me 10 more wins and then ask me that question. <laughs> like, it's very hard to evaluate when we're in the situation we are. It's kind of like... It's not the same thing as with Alex Len, but it's a little similar. Like, Alex Len is a great tank driver. He's probably the best tank driver on our team. So, like, are we really evaluating what he can actually do? Or are they telling him, like, go out and do whatever you want so that we can lose? (laughs) You know? Um, So I think when we're in this tanking situation, it's really, really hard to evaluate, like, what guys are actually doing. That being said, I love watching Big Sauce, and he's a ton of fun. And... The numbers are showing up, so who knows? Yeah, Mitch, I was thinking the exact same thing. We've seen these nice games out of Big Sauce, and I was a little skeptical to, like, fully hop on the I'm really serious about Big Sauce bandwagon, but each game that goes by, he does a little something more, and I guess a little something more means just bullying guys, grabbing boards, that nice floater he's just been doing it all lately and with those tools you you don't have to be seven feet tall to be a good post presence he's got the he's got the width he's got the strength i just love everything about the guy and i think next year he deserves uh he's going to be a restricted free agent this year so i think we match a contract for big sauce i mean as much as i'd like to hope someone says hey big sauce 10 million per year come to our team I don't know, but I'd like—I just like to see him come back. 
So nowhere am I trying to say that I think that Big Sauce is already like, all right, he needs to start in the NBA. Um, I, I'm more of coming from the idea of being a bench player. Um, I'm not thinking of the fact that I think that he needs to start over Alex Lynn. Give me 10 more wins with Big Sauce, and then I will say that he needs to start. But uh, that's just kind of where I'm sitting right now. I think that just as a guy, I mean, like, it's not like we're running plays for him. He's just being active. And I think that's more of where you can see the impact of his game. Um, <coughs> so I think that the impact of his game with no run plays is kind of more what I want to look at and why I think that he definitely has a spot in the NBA. Well, and just his excitement on the bench, I do really enjoy that too. So, I mean, depending on how much he gets offered, I, I'd like to have him on the team next year, even just for that bench presence. Yeah, that's something we all agree on. We love watching the big sauce reactions. And the Suns even put up I'm pretty sure after each game they put up the big sauce reaction of the game. I'm not sure if it's actually for everyone, but everyone I've seen it just gets you happy. So another guy, let's talk about one more guy that we've seen some uh, improvement of as of late, TJ Warren. It looks like he is back to his original form from the beginning of the year. When he started off, he was averaging 18 points per game or so over the first, what was it, five to ten games of the season. But TJ looked fantastic. Him and Bledsoe and Booker all together, we were all hyped up about that. But it looks like since he's returned, and especially since the break, Warren's been turning it up. He Two double-doubles in a row, grabbing rebounds all of a sudden. Great to see out of the guy. But hopefully uh, we see him improve throughout the rest of the season so we really know what we're getting at that three next year. What do you guys think about that? I think that this is a very important time for TJ, especially because if we end up with a three pick, it's likely, that, and this bleeds over a little bit to our draft slash March Madness talk, Josh Jackson, he plays the three. I think him and TJ can thrive together, but... It makes me think, what if we draft Josh Jackson? Josh, oh my gosh, Josh Jackson, excuse me. Oh my gosh, Josh Jackson. <laughs> oh my if gosh. If we draft him, the talented small forward from Kansas, wh what does that mean for TJ um, when it comes to like making a trade during the draft or like packaging him with Bledsoe? Or, I, I have no idea. So, sorry, I was doing just a little bit of quick math here right now. Um, TJ Warren over his last seven games. Seven or eight. I think that's supposed to be eight. No, seven. Seven was right. Is right around, like, 17 points. So, it was supposed to be eight, not seven. Whatever. That's besides the point, really. 16.75 points. So... The big thing to know from this is that he has been consistent for these however much, and his rebound totals have looked great as well, specifically in his last two games, getting double-digit rebounds in both games. Of course, this is before the Maverick game that we're doing this and talking about it. So I think that the fact that TJ has really found some of that consistency again after going through that st stretch after that head injury and even posting up a zero-point game um against or on 215 against the Lakers actually he he's really been able to come back out and turn that corner I love TJ I think this is an interesting time because it is very possible that we end up drafting a small forward at possible pick number three or four um depending on where we land and whether that be Josh Jackson or you know, it could be a Tatum or a point guard. It doesn't matter. If we're looking at that small forward position, we're really evaluating TJ. TJ, And not only has he been putting that up, but he's given continually solid effort on the defensive end, getting basically that PJ Tucker role of playing against the best guy on defense. And I think 
he's really showing up and that consistency has looked really good in my point of view and I've just been really excited to watch him turn it on like he did at the beginning of the season. Absolutely. TJ has been a great replacement for PJ since we've traded him, really stepping up his his uh, defensive efforts. Really great to see that. And let's talk a little bit about another guy that's helping uh, replace PJ Tucker right now. And on last week's episode, we talked about Coach Earl Watson's comments about the Suns needing an enforcer. And it didn't take long, and it looks like we found our guy. No free agent signing necessary. He was here all along. The junkyard dog reemerged back here in Phoenix, and Jared Dudley is our guy who we can count on now to take care of the dirty work, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe not. But so, if you if you somehow missed it, Tyler Eulis was flattened by a dirty screen set by the giant balding sixth Backstreet Boy Jason Smith, and right after it happened, Jared Dudley gave a little nod to it. Must have been to himself. And he just started stomping right up to Smith and gave him a nice little headbutt. And in, in all honesty, honesty, maybe the headbutt was incidental and he was just thro- trying to throw a little weight behind a chest bump. But that's not really the point. Dudley's our new enforcer. A- am I right or am I right? I mean, I kind of thought Dudley was trying to kiss him just a little bit. <laughs> like their faces got really close and... As anyone who has seen the Steve Carell Get Smart movie uh, from, like, I, it was a while ago, that, that's a pretty good tactic to surprise people. So uh, I wasn't quite sure if that's what he was going for, but, uh, yeah, he, he went for it. <laughs> yeah, a smooch from Dudley would definitely throw me off my game and <laughs> make me just wonder about what's going to happen next. That's That's very true. <laughs> but, you know, I just like that someone finally stepped up went a little above and beyond the call like he marched from about half the distance of the court just right up to him and said hey pick on someone your own size this is my boy Euless you don't mess with him so I love it and I hope that's I hope and think that that's the attitude the team is taking as a whole we're we're just not being (laughs) we're just not being messed with anymore I agree. Um, well, was it Earl Watson kind of mentioned how we had some of that 90s mentality or 80s mentality of uh, of um, just like really not backing down and really not caring who we're playing against, but just bringing it. And uh, I think, uh, you know, JMZ deciding to make the J stand for junkyard is part of that mentality. Ooh, that's good. I like that, David. <laughs> all right, so we're all happy that uh, with the attitude of this team, we like that Dudley stepped up, and he—I don't think he deserved a thirty-five thousand dollar fine for the whole deal, but that's a different story. Let, let's move things along here, keeping in track with the rebuild talk. Um, two two other big parts of this new look new look Suns team since the break have been Tyler Eulis and Derek Jones Jr. Both players have very different tools they bring to the table for the Suns team, and it seems like having both of these guys on the floor has really been paying off. And before we talk about the future of these guys, what they bring to the table as a Phoenix Sun, let's talk about the excellent contracts that these two dudes are signed to. And Eulis was drafted in the second round, but we pretty much signed him to a first round contract we gave him a four-year deal where the salary in 2019 2020 climbs only to 1.1 million and then jones jr was undrafted we signed him to a four-year deal with the fourth being a team option and he'll only be making that 1.1 million dollar mark by the end of his contract just like ulis so these two guys seem like they have a ton of potential and we have them locked up nice and cheap for the next few years. So w- what do we think will become of these guys? We've seen Tyler Eulis become the floor general of our bench. He takes care of the ball. He's making the right passes. It seems like he has incredible chemistry and communication with everyone on the court with him. So 
what do we expect after an off season? What what will Ulysses come back as, and what kind of role will he have on the team next year and the next coming years? What do you guys think? I think for sure going into next year as de facto like floor general off the bench. I don't think there's really a question about that. I think that he's definitely earned that spot. Um, I, I I mean, it's tough to really to say from then on, but if he just continues to play with a chip on his shoulder and that tough defense while also bringing in, bringing in an offense at like 5'8", I, I think he could be a starter in the league one day. I think a lot of this is so hard to say right now because it depends on if we get a top two draft pick or not and what we do with that and if Bledsoe is still on the team after the draft Um, this is kind of what I talked about on the Deepish Thoughts podcast which you should still check that out for the full thing but you know there's just so much in question until we know which pick we have and what we do with it so I, I do think either way, Ulysses will probably be coming off the bench to be that floor general, and I've been super happy with his vision and just awareness in general. He's been great about that, especially lately. But uh, yeah, a, a lot of it depends on what happens with the draft. Um, as far as Derek Jones Jr. goes, we've said it before, but it's, it's worth repeating that uh, I think his ceiling is similar to Gerald Green just a huge spark uh plays a little defense dunks a lot i'm cool with that yeah i love having jones jr come off the bench for us um maybe maybe as a third or fourth forward to come off the bench in the future depending on his progression but for what we're doing right now he just makes a ton of sense with that athleticism he makes the highlight plays. He'll he'll throw some blocks out there. Obviously, the dunks are incredible. But ever since that Thunder game that the three of us went to, and Earl Watson puts him in and says, hey, you're guarding Westbrook. I mean, I fell in love with the guy right there. I was like, okay, this is something he can do. That's exciting. So really hoping that Derek Jones Jr. keeps improving on the defense and brings some sort of jump shot to his game. I don't think we've even seen him shoot a jumper yet as a son. I I really don't think we have. So there's something there. There's got to be a bit of a mid-range game there, but we just haven't seen it yet. But hopefully that's something he he incorporates into his game. And then maybe next year, if we don't end up drafting a, a wing, he can fill in behind TJ, but we'll have to see. What do you think, David? Yeah, I, I agree. I think as a third or fourth uh, I, I think a third or fourth wing, um, not necessarily forward. He's not a guy that I really see as a, a power forward or anything or being able to play spot minutes. I see him more as a wing, and I think that's where he kind of fits into that Gerald Green kind of mold in general. Um, of course, Jury is still out on his jump shot, um, but a, a dunker off the bench can get a lot of run in the NBA because everyone's always going to give athleticism a chance and I mean we're we did that so I I enjoy watching him play I think that not only the actual play of him but just the mental aspect of saying okay we're gonna put this undrafted rookie who has just started to get play time on Westbrook um it was as, as much of a mental game as a the actual game of basketball game as well and uh I, I, turn, I think I told you guys right after we got out of that game that uh, his performance, I felt like whatever his contract was, add two years onto it, and that's how much longer he's earned already just because of that, because I thought it was awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he got into Westbrook's head, too. Like, an undrafted rookie who just dunks all the time. Got into Russell Westbrook, potential MVP candidate, though it's not really looking like it as much anymore, but whatever. Russell Westbrook's head like that was amazing yeah and you know it it's easy to get into a hothead's head but it was really not it's just nice to see you could tell that he was a little bit razzled even though he did what score 50 or whatever Russell yeah he still crushed it but 
<laughs> like, it's more of you want Westbrook to crush it and just look to drive to the basket every time. So that way you, you just have Westbrook beat you. And that's what we did. I saw an interesting stat the other day that is, I forget exactly what it was, but when Westbrook shoots more than 25 times, the Thunder have only won like four games or something like that. Four or something games. Out of 20. Like it's really, it hurts them so much when he shoots more than that. And that's what it was like in that game against us. And that's why he's not going to win MVP. Basically. All right. So just to kind of wrap things up here. So I can say this about Tyler Eulis right now. Well, I think I can say this, but I'm not sure about Jones Jr. yet. But next year, I think that Tyler Eulis definitely will be an above average backup. Probably a good to great backup would be my guess within a year or two. And so he's not going to be the main guy in our starting lineup within that time. But I think once the bench comes in and Eulis is in, we're not going to be losing much from our starter and our bench should really be able to take advantage of some guys. So that's what I'm really hopeful for when it comes to these two young dudes. Above average, good to great backups. Agreed. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Cool. All right, so like I said earlier, it's March. We better talk a little March Madness. So in general here, what teams are you guys following this year? Who do you expect to make a splash in the tournament? What do you guys think? Well, obviously Gonzaga. I have to say that first. They don't have really any pro prospects this year, but you should still watch them because they're super fun. And (laughs) this is the best team they've had in a long time. So go Zags. Um, My other team to watch this year... I'm trying to pull up their score because as we're recording this, I know they're playing currently. Um, is Iowa State? Oh, that game's over. Iowa State beat West Virginia, eighty to seventy-four, to win the Big Twelve. Iowa State is my Ooh. team to watch because they are peaking at the exact right time. Uh, Monte Morris, I'm really, really unsure about how he will be in the NBA. Like, I'm sure he'll get drafted, but. I have no clue what he'll look like in the NBA. Sounds um, too close to Markeith and Marcus for me to like. Him. I know, yeah, it's <laughs> kind of scary that I that I have that same thing, but I uh, I don't. He he's pretty good. Um, they played Gonzaga earlier in the season, and the Zags only won by two. Like they played them down to the wire. That this Iowa State team is really good, so keep an eye out for them. Yeah, um, I, th- I think um, Morris, uh, whatever his first name is, I think he's he's kind of right around the mid-second round right now. So a good right. tournament showing could easily get him into like early second, late, late first. first. Like, right. without that's a doubt. So that's going to be interesting. I am always um, a big watcher of Arizona, um, U of A in general. Uh, I watch, I'll watch their football and basketball just whenever, even though I don't really watch college football. But I'm really excited to watch them, which is just one of those teams that they're kind of always there um, when it comes to that. But another team that I'm really excited to watch is um, Oregon. I don't really know a whole lot of the people on the Oregon team, but just watching them play, they are really dang good. And I, I, I like watching some good basketball. Yeah, Dylan Brooks is the guy on that team to watch for sure. Um, the other teams, I'll go through the obvious ones quickly. Kentucky, you said Arizona, Kansas, UCLA, Duke, unfortunately. But uh, Kansas, just because of Josh Jackson, really interested to see what he and Lonzo Ball from UCLA can do on the big stage. That's, you know... Lonzo Ball has been good throughout the season. He he struggled in the Pac-12. Uh, was it the championship game against Arizona? No, championship is... Semifinal? I, th- I think it was semifinal. Championship, I think, is tonight between Arizona and Oregon. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So the semifinal against Arizona, Lonzo Ball struggled. 
So I think that's interesting to see, you know, end of the season struggles and if that's going to continue in the NCAA tournament or how he'll do there. So I'll definitely keep an eye on him um, along with NC State. Yeah. Uh, cool. And oh, go. Um, I watch a little bit of college basketball, and this might not be the popular thing to say as a resident of the Valley here in Phoenix, but I do too like Arizona, the Wildcats. And one guy that I have been following a bit this year, Lowry Markinen. He seems like the real deal for a stretch four type guy. Yeah, he's good. And, you know, we'll move into talking about some prospects here now that I am right now. But um, it makes me think if his stock were to go up a touch, he'd be right in that Suns range of pick. And it makes me think of how we drafted Bender and Chris last year. I don't know. I just, I'm just kind of big on Markinen. And I'm thinking, uh, are we not getting him because of the two stretch type bigs we drafted last year? So that's what I've been thinking about. As much as I'd love to see him in a Suns uni, keep him in Arizona. But I think with Markinen, um, the big question if we were to draft him is if we do truly feel like Bender can play either forward spot in the long haul. Um, a lot of people think he's only a big just because of his height. Um, we have preached. Um, a ton before he got injured about his perimeter defense and stuff so I think if we feel like he can play small forward consistently as he continues to progress I could see that giving us a reason to go for Markinen completely and could Markinen be a potential center at all could he get some of those minutes it looks like he has a, a better frame than a guy like Bender could he maybe be playing that five that's kind of what I was thinking because, again, we don't really know what's going to happen with Chandler and Len over the off season, so we could potentially need to do some work at the five, and I I was kind of thinking along the same lines with uh, like we did with Chris last year trading to get up to that pick so we can take him, but I don't know. There's still a lot of questions, but I I really do like Markinen's game. Yeah. Who are some other guys that you might like to see in a Suns uni or just some guys that you really like to watch so far this year? I'm I'm just like super high on Josh Jackson. Uh, like I I don't like when all this legal stuff comes out. That's what scares me. Right. But like if he can get over that, just the thought of him on our team is so exciting to me. Just someone super athletic who can play the three, run the floor, defend. He, I mean, he's kind of who I want right now, especially because I want to keep Bledsoe on the team, so I'm kind of like, don't draft a point guard. Right, that's the big thing. You know the Suns will be taking BPA when they get up on the clock. So whether that is Ball or Johnson, we just don't know yet. And I wonder how much that draft pick will what kind of difference that will make with Bledsoe if we somehow are up there and Fultz is there which is pretty doubtful at this point but is that enough of a reason to trade Bledsoe I don't know but I'm really excited to see what happens if we do take a point guard yeah I actually have two guys that I'm going to look at are point guard one's point guard one small forward um the other small forward that I want to look at besides Josh Jackson is Jason Tatum. Um, of course, it would have been really awkward because I had to be reminded that he doesn't play for NC State. He plays for Duke. So, go me. But uh, I, I think he's a good tournament away from possibly being argued over Josh Jackson. I know Josh Jackson has the athleticism, but Tatum, I think, is like a year younger, almost on the dot. And uh, he has... Uh, he has what uh, scouts are saying that he has a much more NBA ready game, which is always something as a safety net to look towards. Um, I'm going to really look at Tatum to see if, you know, if we somehow end up at that four spot, I could see him as someone, but also Dennis Smith Jr. from NC State, um, right around the same age as Tatum. So 
about a year younger than Jackson. He is a point guard. He's 6'3", 195. That, that's a pretty good size in my opinion. And mm-hmm. I, I, I just really am interested in his game and want, want to see a little bit more of him if we end up in that four or five spot. So that way I can cover my bases. <laughs> Uh, another guy that I'm interested in seeing is Malik Monk from Kentucky. He's he's just another guy that I think people are divided on a little bit, and I want to see what he can do in the tournament. I feel like Kentucky, um, they haven't really had anyone like super dominant since the Booker Towns year, which was only a couple years ago. But still, like last year and this year, I feel like they've just played way more team ball than anything. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if he can emerge as a star player and what will happen there. Yeah, absolutely. And if we're going point guard, I have one question when we're doing that draft interview. And it's going to be, how do you feel about passing the ball to Devin Booker? (laughs) And whoever responds the best by saying all the balls I'm going to pass to Devin Booker. <laughs> that's that's the guy I want on my team, no matter who it is. Yeah, and I mean, talking about those point guards, also, um, uh, Jawan, Jawan Evans, I think his name is, from Oklahoma State, we're kind of getting uh, pegged in draft boards for picking him with our second round pick. I think looking at just a couple of the guys, including Dylan Brooks from Oregon, um, right around that spot would be good to look at um, because, you know, second round pick, that's where we were able to get Tyler Uless. Um, There have been some interesting picks in years past in that early second round because once you really get into that late first, early second, it's kind of a a juggling match of who's going to be what. They're all around the same normally. So sometimes those late, those early second picks can be just the same as the late first picks. So um, looking at some of those guys, um, I think the three are, it's Jason Blossom game from Clemson, Dylan Brooks from Oregon, and then Jawan Evans from Oklahoma State. Just looking at those guys, um, those are, those are guys that could, with a good tournament showing, slip into the late first or um, just stay kind of where they are, but just interesting to watch yeah i think that's a great point um i do need to throw one zag name out there just because it's me if you're gonna watch anyone for the sake of nba prospecting zach collins seven footer backup center to shemek karnowski who uh, probably won't get drafted but he's a good college player but zach collins is a freshman from Las Vegas, went to Bishop Gorman, the same school that uh, Shabazz Muhammad went to. Um, Really, really nice touch in the paint. Pretty good footwork, good defense, good hustle. Uh, He'll probably stay for at least another year, kind of like Sabonis did, how he had a good freshman year coming off the bench. A lot of people thought he could go to the NBA, but he waited one more year so he could dominate in college and then go to the draft. So, if you want to look that far ahead, Zach Collins is the guy to watch. Hmm. Well, speaking of big guys, that's kind of what I'm hoping we manage to snag a really good one with that late second rounder. There's, I don't think there's a... Over on Draft Express, I don't even know if there's a true center in the top in the lottery for that mock draft. So hopefully there's a guy that McDonough has his eye on that could uh, be a bit of a sleeper, one that we can get in the second and kind of take some time to groom. It'd be nice to have a big that we have time to do that with, I think. I agree. All right. More draft talk. Anyone else got anything? Uh, Shout out to Cal. Um, I think they're going to make it. I thought they were on the cusp or something. Um, But uh, Ivan Rab, I've seen some play of him. I think he's going to be like a mid first, late first kind of guy. Um, Maybe if we're lucky, he has a bad showing or something and ends up falling into the early second, but at power forward, possibly small center. I think he's an interesting guy to watch. Cool. 
All right, boys, let's end this show the way we always do. It's time for David's Comic Book Corner, Mitch's Face Melting Minute, and then I am going to probably talk about a computer game. So, David, (laughs) take it away. All right, so what I'm going to go ahead and shout out is Old Man Logan Volume 3 um, by... Uh, Jeff Lemire. I don't remember exactly who the art's by, but it's just a fantastic book. Um, it was there was originally a book called Old Man Logan um, back in like the mid late two thousands, and it's basically about like post apocalyptic world, and uh, Wolverine is kind of just this weird Clint, East, Clint Eastwood character. It's a really fun book, but they decided to bring him back after an event called Secret Wars because there was a whole bunch of weird comic booky stuff. So anyways, it's an old Wolverine, and it's kind of paralleling the world that was in that kind of like what-if Old Man Logan original one and how he got to the point where it is in that book while also going along in this different world that he's in now. It's a lot of fun, and... I've just been kind of thinking about that a lot because I went and saw Logan in IMAX over the weekend and I cried manly tears (laughs) of happiness and sadness. A single manly tear. (laughs) There there may have been two or three single tears, but... uh, A thousand single manly tears. (laughs) (laughs) It it was great. I loved it. And uh, uh, I just want to see it again and again because it was really good cool good stuff all right i'll hop in and i'm going to plug the computer game software inc it is a like a simulator type slash tycoon type game where you're starting a software company back in 1980 and then you create different types of programs or games or operating systems and it's just one of those fun simulator games night it can be slow paced uh, you don't get too hyped up when you're playing it. Just, uh, you know, simulator games, really nice way to pass the time when you get some free time. And if you're like me, you're going to play them while you have free time and waste all of your free time playing computer games. But, <laughs> I mean, that's the cycle. It's beautiful. I, I'm playing a computer game where you make computer games, and I don't know if I'll ever get out of the cycle. But anyways, Software Inc., I think it's like 15 bucks on Steam. Good stuff. Check it out. And Mitch, go for it. Well, that's just like the peak of civilization, isn't it? Exactly. 1980 <laughs> software development. Well, a, a computer <laughs> game about making a computer game. Like, Listen. what's going to be next? A Hot Pocket flavored Hot Pocket? Ooh. Okay. Boo. Can only imagine. <laughs> a che- Cheeto and buttermilk flavored Hot Pocket? <laughs> Cereal. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My plug is an album that came out in 2005 called Alaska by Between the Buried and Me. This is super, super prog metal. It's awesome. Um, On the way back from Phoenix, I listened to this album like four times in a row, and I've had it on my iPod for years, but I decided to come back to it, and I just forgot how amazing it was. Uh, My favorite songs are All Bodies, the first track, Crokies and Boat Shoes, and then my all-time favorite song by uh, Between the Buried and Me, Selkie's The Endless Obsession. So check that out for some like super cool, proggy, unpredictable, cool metal stuff. Perfect. All right, that's going to do it for this week, everybody. Be sure to check us out on social media, Twitter handle, at Sunny and PHX Pod. Hit our email up with questions or suggestions at sunnyinphxpod at gmail.com and of course check out the website at sunnyinphxpod.com and be sure to tune in next week be sure to check our social media for our new network information too by the way all right see you next week go suns